I want to move on to our second keynote speaker, uh, that is uh, Al Blackburn. Uh, he is very, very special to uh, both Onas project as well as COD project. Uh, he has been champion from day one. Uh, and as I told you, he is the one who basically educated me about central office, what role central office is playing. Uh, of course, with uh, Tom Anschutz as well. So five years from now, if COD really becomes something big and uh, successful, Please remember that Al and Tom Anchut from at and have played a very important role. Uh, Al, until very recently, used to be um, a VP of Domain 2.0, architecture and strategic planning and so on. Uh, as you know, that is a big, big initiative by at and uh, to transform their infrastructure. And Al has been the key leader uh, doing that. Uh, uh, recently, he has decided to change his role and become uh, a distinguished engineer in part of the Access Group and is now driving that. Uh, he has many years at at and has accomplished a lot. I'm not going to go through all of that. With that, Al, yep. uh, Good to go. welcome. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. All right. So, Guru, thanks a lot of people I've noticed. Uh, and you do a good job. And Guru, I want to thank you because since you know the inception of Domain 2 five years ago, I think it's been, uh, we were talking about this at dinner last night. Um, Guru has been a common thread through all of those five years. And I got an email from someone at at and recently and they said, Al, I'm really sorry I didn't get back with you on time. I had stuff to do for Guru, right? And so Guru, seriously, you know, your passion for this work, your leadership, um, your integrity, and your ability to drive for results in Cord and Onos, uh, I think, is really is very much appreciated by everybody here, I'm sure, and it's certainly by me. So uh, it's always nice to see your smiling face. So. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about where AT&T is. Uh, it's going to have a little bit of a domain two flavor on it because, uh, as Guru mentioned, uh, I took a big leap. I'm one of those people that uh, decided to become an engineer by choice at AT&T moving forward. I'm at that point in my life where uh, it feel, felt like the right thing to do. And one thing I've noticed within AT&T is that most of our senior leadership is now listening to the engineers more than they are the middle managers. So, <laughs> and that's a good thing. That barrier is becoming very permeable, right? And I absolutely love it. So, uh, so I'm honored to be part of the uh, engineering community. Tom now is my peer uh, and uh, we have a great time. So. With that, um, so um, Craig mentioned traffic growth. Um, AT&T, 114 petabytes per day uh, is what we carry on our network. So if you put the zeros behind that for a moment, if you can in your mind, it's hard for me, um, but that's a lot of data. Uh, the vast majority of it is video, about 60% 60, 60 of it is video. Uh, if you're trying to put your arms around that number still, that's about 140 million hours of HD movies per day, right? So uh, that's a lot of data. Uh, and it is growing quite substantially. Uh, now with 5G, if you've seen sort of the, you know, I'll call it hype, but there's some, you know, there's there's a lot of realism to what we're doing with 5G within AT&T and the industry as a whole, actually. Um, we begin to push that spectrum a little bit. Right, because now we're not only dealing with these big elephant flows, we also have the 10 billion plus blinking lights. You know, things that sit out there with their 10-year battery life that you know, you know, once a week or so open up and send a blip of a packet. Right, so the dynamic range of the type of devices, the endpoints we support, and the types of data they send are beginning to widen substantially, um, and that affects our network. Right, it's really the you know, historical networks weren't designed to do that. So the network traffic continues to grow and change. Mm -hmm. Services decouple from infrastructure. I say we all, we I feel like we've cracked this nut, right? I think the industry is starting to to really. I mean, we're in full blown execution mode on domain two, right? So we met all of our commitments for AIC deployments last year. Actually, we exceeded them, and we're still on our path to meet our targets for virtualization. You know, every supplier that we do business with are virtualizing their uh, network functions. The next, the next big um, foray into this decoupling, and maybe Google and others can help us with this, and Samsung and Radisys and our new partners, I'm so excited, um, is going to be disaggregating the software itself. So Craig mentioned the virtual BNG, right? Well, the cord that we deployed uh, that in a trial mode actually has the virtual BNG disaggregated. We have a virtual router, 
and we have a virtual subscriber gateway. And you'll hear more about that later from the people that know a lot more than I. And so it begins, makes you think, well, couldn't I use that virtual router for other things too, right? And not just for a virtual BNG. So we're starting to move beyond that point where we're just saying, you know what, lop off your I.O., recompile it for x86, and you're good to go, right? We're starting to say, question the way you've designed your software architecture. Um, and we're making some progress there. It's a little bit more difficult because that gets it to the heart of, of what many of our software suppliers do for a living. So we had to convince folks that there's some opportunity there. Operational paradigm shifts. Wow, OPEX uh, for a carrier environment is substantial, right? Um, and you know the construction and engineering budget alone, right? That's hard work, right? That's a fact. Um, that's probably uh, going to continue because bearing fiber is bearing fiber, as <laughs> Craig probably all well know. All well knows, you know, you got all sorts of regulatory issues and stuff like that to deal with. Um, but the rest of the operating our network. It could really use some, use some help from what we're seeing from big data and machine learning and artificial intelligence. I think the time is about right to begin to apply some of those uh, concepts here. Um, existing networks must evolve, blah, blah, blah. And I already said five. And security identity and authentication. So we have a dedicated group on D2 that are just dealing with all of these bizarro security issues with how to run network functions on this infrastructure that we're building called AIC, right? Okay, um, I call this widening dynamic, uh, dynamic range. If I was doing a wireless presentation on 5G, I would call it something else, but I only wanted to make a point here in the, uh, in the court summit uh, for a simple reason. Um, you start to see things like this, you know, that should be boggling engineering minds, right? Because, what is that, about a 10 mile radius speed of light, right? So, uh, so the range of performance that's being asked for out of 5G itself, right, is very substantial, right? Um, you know, who wants to get that data rate up there? You know, an edge throughput of 100 megabits per second, what's the peak? Peaks out at 20 gig, right? So there we're into some heavy you know, spectrum management and some really cool antenna designs. If you're really into this stuff and you want some really good weekend reading, just look at some of the, the current antenna designs, right? Uh, some of the beam forming and, and other techniques with MIMO that are coming out. It's really quite awesome. All right. Um, and then really quick before I forget, I wanted to say something about the central office. So. Yeah, you know, AT&T and other carriers, they have lots of these things, thousands of central offices. Each one, you know, maybe have different flavors or, or whatnot. Um, but it really hits you when you take the central office term away and you call it a wire center. Because if you've ever been to the basement of a central office and you look, you're like, wow. You know, they have these huge conduits of copper and fiber that run in east and west for diversity. And then you realize you know, why people say, well, gosh, you know, you could sell that central office or something, right? And no, they're wire centers. They're like big, giant input-output funnels, right? So uh, these things are critical assets for us for deploying future services, and, and we want to make use of them. So here's the, you know, the, the standard D2 kind of feel. You know, we're moving from specialized appliances, hardware and software, uh, high-volume COTS. The one thing I added to this slide that I normally don't have for this summit is purposed hardware. Right, because we're seeing cases in mobile, and I think for PON, the Mac Fi, our example of where we would have purposed hardware. How we treat that as a peripheral or integrated within our AIC infrastructure is yet to be determined. We're having some active discussions about how we want to deal with that. But there will be high volume commercial off the shelf systems. That's what we generally run our network workloads on. When you're pushing down into access, there will be some purposed hardware. So we're also talking about maybe innovating in some DSP pooling technologies, slicing it for different applications as an example. So that's some examples of uh, purposed hardware. And then flexible and soft, uh, flexible software, right? So this is like the, uh, the golden view, right? So when we achieve this, then we're done, <laughs> okay? All right, so people have probably read about this in the press. This is our big banner goal, we call it, 75% uh, of our network be using cloud infrastructure and SDN by 2020. Um, AT&T takes a lot of liberties with the term SDN, so really now it's become pretty much a catch-all phrase for everything. So 
uh, like it or not, um, uh, we're well on our way there. We track this. Uh, I get a report every day on on whether you know whether or not we're meeting our objectives uh, for this year. Uh, for this year, the objective is thirty percent. Um, and making good progress. And I think the vast majority of that is Mobile Packet Corp. I remember right, Doug Ng is somewhere. He can confirm that later in one of his talks. Okay, so um, this was our you know, con fundamental key principle, or we call them our imperatives. We actually have 12 principles that right behind these that every project must go through. So when I say that you know, something like domain two was transformational, you have to kind of go back and remember a couple of years ago when we announced we removed the terms network and IT from our company. They're gone. We have technology development, we have technology architecture design, and technology operations, right? So there's no classic enterprise IT network boundary anymore that exists within our company, right? And so we, we from top down, we push that organizational change. Um, the way we do work within the company has changed. And I think the, most of the employees really enjoy it. So uh, that's, a, that's all good. I think most telecoms, I was just talking to, uh, I'm not gonna call them out, um, uh, with, uh, with a peer company, um, you know, was asking how do you do it? And I'm telling you, it takes legal finance, um, your chief executives to really kind of come together and say, yeah, we have to make this pivot. Now, if you just think for a moment what we talked about in terms of the traffic growth and a dynamic range, I would argue you have to make the pivot if you want to survive, right? Okay, so we want to open our network, simplify and scale, increase value. Um, we show this slide to, you know, at every sort of uh, new supplier meeting we have. We want to make sure they buy into these concepts. Uh, we definitely want to be more modular. Uh, network APIs is the, you know, one of our you know, key fundamental things. We're having some you know, issues um, you know, sort of trying to figure out what the, what the disaggregation points in the new RAN will be, right? And so uh, we've got a couple of different schools of thought in the industry there that we're working through on where those uh, will likely be because there is some, uh, some advantages and disadvantages uh, in terms of where you do that split and those performance metrics we showed. Simplify and scale to a common NFE infrastructure. Common, common, right? So. Right now, we're going through this process called normalization because, um, let's face it, you know, as we kind of started to turn the gear on domain two, uh, there was some very unique use cases. Storage was one, right? So we custom spec some high-performance storage applications, right? And they needed a per particular type of build, so we built an AIC spec for that storage application. It really kind of looks unique, but really what it looks like is a very high performance AIC node. That's what it looks like. And so it became a standard node type, right? And so a lot of people, not just storage applications, are asking for that build type. All right. Um, agile, elastic, dynamic, cost performance leadership, enable new growth. Uh, one thing that used to be up there, but I don't see any more cycle time. Um, surprising. Uh, but anyway, I wrote that slide, so I'm wondering whose version I pulled. <laughs> uh, cycle times was actually number one on increased value. Um, and um, the, the reason I know it was on there is because Mr. Donovan himself asked it to be number one. So if you're trying to think about where, from a perspective, uh, perspective in terms of when we're talking about value, if, if the industry doesn't improve cycle times, it's phenomena it's like you know Pokemon Go, uh, you see people roaming around with their phones. Um, you, know, you just can't predict these things, right? So we, we have to be able uh, to improve our cycle times in order to, to react, pr you know, proactively, right? And does that make sense? Proactively respond to those changes in network load and network traffic, right? Um, I think that the worst case scenario, that one just kills battery life. But <laughs> All right. So this is a slide. I actually don't know if I shared this one. If I did, I may have shared it in maybe one or a summit uh, last year. Um, but the reason I like this slide, even though it's very busy, it gives you an idea of, of where the innovation needs to go, right? So when you say national, you know, less than 50, regional metro, 300 to 600, 
end office 5,000 plus, remote 100,000 to 100 million. So mm -hmm. I went to our AIC build architect two weeks ago and I said, can you give me an AIC node in a NEMA enclosure, right? Just for effect, you know, that's those little sealed boxes, right? You may see mounted on a pole or the side of your house, right? Gives you an idea of where even beyond the central office, we're thinking about, you know, where one might put various types of compute storage services, right? And networking. And so uh, this is not dr drawn to scale, but I would say that, you know, I would, from a scorecard perspective, and I'm not a scoring person, and so this is just my view. Uh, so don't put this like in the Wall Street Journal, otherwise it'll be weird. Uh, but national, I would rate AT&T an A, right? We know how to build AIC nodes and scale them out at the national level. Regional Metro, probably an A as well, right? Where the gray area comes in is here and here, right? Uh, and that is scaling down, it turns out, is very difficult, right? Cords demonstrated this, right? Uh, we've demonstrated on our own AIC builds, right? And so we're looking for ways, for instance, you know, we don't have to deploy OpenStack to every single node we, we put out there, right? That burns up an entire server by itself, right? For some of these workload type. So figuring out how we scale these things down economically to meet the workload demand while still staying true to an elastic cloud principle. That means we can spin up new workloads and, and sort of engineer that out, right? Uh, because keep in mind, a lot of these will still be front-ended with that specialized hardware, right? That, that has to do the, they have to do the MacPy termination, right? Uh, the other functions, push that up if you can. You know, centralize, you know, wherever you can, distribute if you must, right? Okay, and so really that's what this shows. And, We've got scores of people working on this one right now um, in terms of, you know, how we're going to roll out 5G, uh, you know, just like everybody else, you know, fixed first, um, and then we'll roll to the use cases that are a little bit more interesting. Um, okay, um, this is my really bad attempt at trying to do free form, if you're wondering, okay? All right, this is how much coffee I drink during the day. <laughs> All right, this was two hands with my hands on the mouse and a big screen. Um, but this is basically the cord architecture, right? Uh, no surprise there. And I would argue that there's many more workload and application types that will be coming into the future, right? But this is a, a good representation. Where, where we're looking is that, you know, there are some nodes that we're specifying that are leaf only now, right? Why? The fundamentals of networking don't go away with this new paradigm. The fundamentals of networking mean you have to aggregate traffic, right? You have to do statistical, stat, you have to get your stat mux gains out of your traffic, right? And so we have leaf only nodes deployed that basically act as aggregators, right? Okay. And so there's could be types of builds in you know, very remote offices that only take a portion of this, a portion of that, and a portion of the app and we deploy it out because that's good enough. So the thing that we don't want to give up, though, is the commonality of operations. So if it looks the same to operations and it feels the same, but it just happens to be smaller because it's a few, you know, serving a fewer number of customers, who really cares? We'll scale up operations to, to deal with that because it's really not a big scale people problem for them, right? All right, does that make sense? It almost looks like slicing, but it's not the traditional view of a network slice. It's more how do we slice the, the infrastructure. Okay, um, and this will be the, the final slide that I have. Uh, and this is some key observations that I have um, for this particular summit. Uh, obviously, at t has learned a lot over the last three or four years, um, uh, but scaling down continues to be a challenge how we scale down, and this is where I really think Cord can be a big help. So get the best and brightest minds on figuring out how we build this, make sure I get this right, light and right. Infrastructure, right, uh, is really important. The second observation is ECOMP worked, right? And you saw our announcement that we've released that, or are releasing it to open source. And you know, that that is near and dear to me because that was one of my babies, right? Um, and, uh, and to see it in operation is really wonderful, right? Um, 
you know, the master service orchestrator, you know, is pulling in recipes, it's orchestrating workloads, data collection is pulling up that, you know, the, the analytics and, and rolling it up and policies, you know, is forcing decisions on, on rehoming and other things. It's really pretty amazing. I mean, it is a good piece of work and we'll have to figure out uh, what we do with that moving forward. Uh, I'm really excited that, you know, Jim and other people are gonna help us figure out how to navigate uh, ECOMP uh, moving forward into the open ecosystem uh, in, in the right way. Um, consistency of onboarding standards and best practices la are lacking, right? And so this was our announcement that probably folks saw with Orange, right? You know, it's too much of a burden to our suppliers to say you got to do it this way for one company, this way for another company, that way for, you know, that other company. So we're actually trying to help as a community to say, you know, is there a common way that we can figure out how to onboard workloads on a carrier infrastructure so you don't have to build it 10 different ways. Just do it one way and it'll work for all. We think that's good for everybody. Uh, performance and flexibility can be found without violating key principles. Right. If I could, I could retire just on the amount of time, staff time dollars that were spent on arguing about SRIOV. I, unbelievable. Right. And I go to AWS and I say, there it is right there. You just point and click. They have it. Right. You use SRIOV. What's our problem? Right. And so it became a non-issue. And so we have uh, template types for SRIOV because we needed that forwarding plane performance now. Right. At that time. Um, Working in an open community, uh, sharing a purpose is fun. So, you know, one thing I've known, and, and you know, I see a lot of friendly faces in here that I've known for a long time, is that, man, if you're not inspired by this, this open community work, I, I don't know, you <laughs> maybe need another job because this is probably, you know, one of the most awesome times in telecommunications. I mean, it's, you know, I was, I've been in it for 32 years, and for about 10 years it was asleep. I mean, just, you know, we, uh, John Metamata, I'm going to get credit him with this quote. He says, telecom is finally awoke from its slumber, right? And that's really cool, right? So anyway, thank you all. Uh, that's all I have. Um, and do you have any questions? Thank you. Yep, you're welcome. Any questions Nope. Okay, I Good guess uh, we'll get uh, move on. Thank you, Al. You're welcome.